Thank you so much for the introduction. Actually, you've tackled a lot of things that I plan to present here in my presentation. So first, uh, thanks organizer for calling me to be among this really fantastic speakers. And so uh, what I would like uh, to present is uh, first uh, the problem of getting better, as we already mentioned, treatment of these patients. So if you look on this very large uh, sample of patients from US, that is more than 400,000 patients that were admitted for cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction, we can see that their survival was increasing, so mortality decreasing during this first years. But then in the last decade of this follow-up, we actually stuck, we <coughs> plateaued with our success how to treat these patients although we do a lot considering uh, early complete revascularization, introduction of mechanical circulatory support, drugs, etc. So as we all know, the very beginning uh, problem in the cardiogenic shock is chemodynamic derangement. So of course, decreasing of cardiac output, tissue hyperperfusion, typically accompanied with an increase in filling pressures. So this is the first NOXA. But we also know that many non-survivors uh, with cardiogenic shock actually die with normalized cardiac index. We can see here a result from a trial from 2003 that amongst these patients that were treated for cardiogenic shock, actually 45% died with normalized cardiac index. So it's not everything in hemodynamics. And we know that just augmentation of hemodynamics uh, by introducing MCL, MCS, quite often doesn't give us the result that we do expect. And we now know that it's not only the problem in macrohemodynamics, and so we shifted to this hemometabolic concept that was already mentioned. So the response of patient to this initial NOXA, and it's sometimes it's very important, what was the initial NOXA? If it was myocardial you know, infarction, it was some myocarditis. So we have a local and systemic inflammatory response and this we then also um, cyto a cytokine storm and oxidative stress affects the involvement and progression of cardiogenic shock and we know that we now have uh, several uh, stages and it's very difficult to tell when one stage stops and the other stage begins. We know that one of the crucial moments in this how to say breakdown in this uh, evolution of cardiogenic shock is microcirculatory dysfunction. So when it does happen, we are in big trouble. And we then already have a problem with organs, target organs, <coughs> that were already started to be injured, and then we have organ that is dysfunctional, finally fail. And we have then a patient who we cannot treat with just augmentation of uh, uh, hemodynamic support with mechanical circulatory support and we have refractory cardiogenic shock. And also this is not a one-way street. So when we have a patient with failing heart, then these organs and their damages actually do some kind of same problem to the heart. This is bi-directional problem. And so it's difficult actually to treat all these points that are uh, happening, multiplating at the same moment in the same patient. If we look uh, uh, results, and this has mentioned a very large database of patients, we can see that about one quarter of patients in this uh, trial, in this study, uh, didn't have uh, organ failure, uh, one third had single organ failure and uh, one third had multi-organ failure. And we can see that during this observation period, we have a steady increase of a failure of uh, especially respiratory, other uh, or organ systems that were uh, followed. And any of these uh, systems, of course, um, uh, complicated the outcome of these patients, especially when they were multiplying. If we go back and look in their survival curves, uh, mortality curves, then we can see that patients without organ failure, they actually continued to improve the results, improved survivals uh, during this period. But these patients with multi-organ failure, they reached this plateau. And 
Obviously, that's uh, something that's a problem how to deal a patients with cardiogenic shock because we are treating now consequences of, of this. And if we look into risk profile of these patients, then we can see that these patients typically had higher baseline comorbidities. So quite often there was some chronic also organ damage. These are older people and so there is typical acute on chronic damage and it makes this pathophysiology even more complex. What about acute kidney injury? We know that kidneys is particularly prone to um, damage to injury in this hypoperfusion and also especially congestion. It's quite often uh, accompanied and we still actually use uh, let's say classical biomarkers that are clinically available. We use k digos uh, definition and staging so we use uh, measuring urine output and measuring filtration marker creatinine but we know that creatinine in this non steady state so declining kidney function is not probably the best marker but at the same time we found out different other markers novel markers they sound much more attractive like cystatin C, NGL etc but there is still no enough evidence that these markers are better and that they give us uh, more information, at least information that will treat our way of treatment to these patients. Uh, what are the risk factors? Of course, age, as I said, previous chronic disease, nephrotoxic drugs, contrast ages, etc. What's the incidence of acute kidney injury according to KDIGO definition? So it's about one third of patients in CART shock study and this large uh, US uh, database and there is a wide range of patients that were treated with uh, renal replacement therapy as it was uh, questioned at the beginning of this symposium when we start with renal replacement therapy obviously also depends on uh, very centers. Acute kidney injury is a strong predictor of bad outcome of course of mortality we know that it causes additional non-renal complications like especially bleeding and infection sepsis and it uh, really defines the outcome of our patient. What about liver injury? It's even more difficult to uh, quantitate this injury, to define this injury, but we know that also the combination of NOXA, typical ischemia, congestion, but quite often, of course, hepatotoxic drugs and also sepsis, infection, increased metabolic demands, hypoxemia and everything uh, affects the function of the liver and leads to damage to these cells and then we have some biomarkers. These are very old biomarkers and we still use them to define liver injury. So when we say acute liver injury, it's defined that there is increase for at least 20% ALT increase from the baseline. If this increase is uh, really sharp, more than 20 times, then we talk about uh, ischemic or hypoxic hepatitis and it's uh, extremely uh, dangerous complication. Here we can see the incidence of acute liver injury. First we can see just the elevation of L18 total in patients from card shock studies, so 60% of patients did have L18 elevation, but uh, uh, through this definition of 20% increase, there is a quarter of patient that had acute liver injury and from EABP shock 2 trial we have uh, a result that about 20% of patients had this extreme uh, hypoxia driven damage and as we can see here it definitely uh, very strongly affects the outcome, the prognosis of these patients. So for example uh, uh, hospital mortality was almost 70% among patients with uh, ischemic hepatitis. What about acute liver failure? It's defined, I would say, even uh, more uh, 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 not so clear. So we typically uh, uh, use the definition hepatic encephalopathy and coagulopathy. That's it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to tell, is this enough to tell when liver fail? We also have some other markers of liver failure that we may use, like bilirubin increase, 
like arterial ammonia level and we also know that we heard about hyperglycemia but hypoglycemia is something that portends really a very poor prognosis there is also hypoalbuminemia but hypoalbuminemia seems to actually be a much more difficult uh, uh, explanation for hypoalbuminemia because we know that uh, uh, T pole of this molecule is one to two weeks, so there is a very sudden drop in this molecule, and obviously it's not related just to liver function, to liver synthesis. And then there is another organ system. Actually, we quite often put this organ system aside, but it's one of the first organs that's affected in cardiogenic shock. So that's gastrointestinal system, weird combination of hypoperfusion congestion, but also our treatment, especially epinephrine. Uh, vasoconstrictor molecules leads to dysfunction of this system, peristalsis, we know that these patients are prone to GI bleeding, many of them are on dual antiplatelet therapy and heparin, etc. Also quite often develop syndrome abdominal hypertension and nevertheless it's very important to remind that this damage to intestinal mucosa uh, makes this system um, permeable for bacteria translocation in their endotoxins and everything actually that then further stimulates not only local inflammation but this systemic inflammation and also increase the risk of sepsis. And also we don't have actually organ specific marker of injury of this very organ system. We use clinical scores, we may use list, uh, uh, risk clinical scores, but they, uh, and they include many of these parameters of organ dysfunction, but I would say that maybe they're not uh, sensitive enough, maybe they don't give us information on what's going in a patient on time. And actually when these markers start to uh, to, to be positive, to increase, maybe it's too late. So there's a tendential, it's, it, it was mentioned already here, uh, to uh, look for some biomarkers who may tell us this metabolic problem, so this transition from the hemodynamic to uh, hemometabolic problem. So there are uh, some investigations that gives us, uh, give us hope that maybe in the future will deal with uh, some uh, tool, tool that will help us in clinical decision making. One of this score is CLIP score. It takes in, into account uh, four markers, cystatin C, lactate, interleukin-6 and anti-pro-BNP. And it was shown for <coughs> this marker actually to have a better prediction of this patient's outcome in comparison to uh, uh, clinical markers like EABP shock 2 risk score or uh, SUPS2 score. There is also, we know that in the cardiogenic shock, there is uh, uh, some signal and synthesis of proteins and four proteins were detected, complex of four proteins, as a marker of uh, early damage to organs. It, it has very high uh, 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 possibility to predict the, uh, uh, the uh, organ failure uh, so maybe uh, this risk score will, will help us to detect this, what we were already uh, talked about, to see when our patient should be treated more aggressively and don't wait for, I know, too high lactates or low pH or I don't know what, what uh, 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 not that sensitive markers of uh, progressing our patient from uh, cardiogenic shock that we can treat and we can make patient alive to the phase of cardiogenic shock when actually everything is futile. So in conclusion, I would say that we have a problem with this non-cardiac organ incidence. It's actually um, getting more and more frequent and we are dealing with uh, more complex patients, older patients, more comorbidities and the future is not very bright, I would say, in treating of these patients. But these non-cardiac organ damage is something that uh, limits the success of our treatment of these patients in uh, uh, cardiogenic shock. We don't know, uh, uh, of course, we know a lot, but still I think we are far from knowing pathophysiology and knowing when to define organ injury, when there is dysfunction, when there is failure, so where the boundaries so that we can maybe change uh, our uh, um, 
aspect of the patient and maybe change uh, the idea how to treat the patient and also when some extent of injury is reversible and maybe where we have to stop or maybe not to start treat these patients if some of these injury is reversible. We, as I mentioned, for gastrointestinal system are still lacking some organ specific injury markers, not only test in brain, lung, endothelium, so microcirculation. We have a lot of information now, but we still don't know what to do with these information. So I think, as I already mentioned, future risk scores maybe will help us in clinical decision making. So it's very difficult nowadays to decide when to treat a patient, especially when to stop to treat the patient, so when uh, the treatment is futile. And we of course need the, uh, treatment strategies, maybe uh, strategies that could prevent this non-cardiac organ damage or maybe even reverse organ dysfunction when it arises. Thank you very much for your attention.